I've lived in London my whole life, and I grew up here in the 1980s. This means that I saw Indiana Jones at the London Muse. I used to pick cherries that is now a sub at an orchard that's now a subdivision on Colonel Talbot Road. And I remember when Southdale and Wonderland was virtually empty. A changing and sprawling London is not a new phenomenon. When my parents went to Western in the 1960s, they remember operating farms just west of Warncliffe Road. My dad tells me the story of when he asked a girl on a date and went on a day trip to Byron. Uh, contemplating these sorts of uh, transitions, um, let's, fill the, let's fill the air here with some memories of London in the past. So here's a picture of Byron, uh, present day. This is where my, my dad went on that invigorating day trip back in the 1960s. Today it's popular for the LCBO and uh, the a and In any case, contemplating these sorts of transitions makes me wonder what it would be like if I could pick up the phone and call London in the 1920s. What would I say to them? What would I ask of them? Would I encourage them to build a city that was better for London 100 years down the road? In turn, what would happen if a future Londoner could call me? What would they ask of me? Would they trust that I have their interests in mind? And most importantly, would they appear in a vortex of flashing light and demand, give me your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle? The idea of a city being an intergenerational entity invokes the concept of sustainability. This is a buzzword as of late, but the most dynamic and comprehensive application of the concept involves uh, addressing it three interdependent pillars, economy, society, and the environment. Globally, economies are in crisis, and while Canada is in relatively good shape, London is uh, not faring that well compared to other cities in our region. Unemployment is at around 10%, which means one in 10 people in this room cannot find a job. A weak economy triggers social concerns. There's lots of organizations in London that are doing some great work, uh, but I think things could perhaps be a little better. Food bank visits, for example, are up 28% over the past decade. This is a number that I think most of us would expect to be in decline, a steady decline. And our immediate environmental uh, health could be a little better as well. Consider the state of air quality in London ranked worse than Ontario. Uh, it's a complex issue, air quality, but I think the good news is that 80% of air pollution in London occurs right here in our city. Uh, the interdependence of these themes points to the concept of resilience. Uh, this represents the ability of a system to respond to crisis or challenges. And I wonder if London is a resilient city. I often think about this. And I also wonder if London in the 1920s actually tried to make London in the 2000s a more resilient city. Lots of uh, uh, cities in our region are adopting sustainability organizations. Uh, sustainability Waterloo focuses on carbon footprint. Sustainability Hamilton focuses on corporate social responsibility. Uh, other entities are pitching what they're doing in terms of economic initiatives. So they're creating green jobs. They're mitigating against the financial risk of future carbon policy. And uh, you know, saving energy translates to saving money. Uh, many cities, or some cities, are even articulating what they're doing in terms of building a resilient and competitive city. And this speaks to uh, the importance and the benefits of addressing social, environmental, and economic challenges in a collaborative way. And of course, there's Vancouver. They're setting out to be the greenest city in the world. Phenomenal set of priorities backed by hard targets, uh, really transparent reporting, and a board of directors that includes London's own David Suzuki. Uh, London does not have a singular entity that's coordinating its sustainability efforts. There are numerous initiatives here that are taking place that should make us very optimistic. The Million Tree Challenge, for example, is a collaborative effort that's going to plant a million trees in our city over the next decade. Uh, in addition to leading the round table on sustainability, the City of London is putting uh, energy front and center and has put forward some very interesting content and reports on London's overall carbon footprint. There's Eco Living London, London Strengthening Neighborhood Strategy, the London Community Foundation, Thames Talbot Land Trust, London Economic Development Corporation. Uh, all, all of these are entities and initiatives that I think could be part of a coordinated sustainability effort. And if you look at Western, a city within a city, uh, they've done their roundtable sessions and they've actually landed on a timeline for their sustainability plan with Imagine 2022. These, these things make me optimistic. Not the type of optimism that would have us hold hands and sing we are the world, um, though I would have Kenny Loggins on my November team next year if he'll join it. 
It's a pragmatic optimism. Ask the right questions, identify opportunities, such as local food. Uh, we've got the London Food Charter, the Elgin Oxford Middlesex Food Sustainability Plan, Permaculture Groups, Veggie City, Community Gardens, and I think with some coordination, we could be a leader among Canadian cities in this, in this area. So what does a sustainable London look like? Where, we are, where are we today, and, and what are our most significant opportunities? What entities are involved, and how will they collaborate, and how will Londoners be engaged? These are all crucial questions, I think. These are some of the questions that will affirm and connect the very promising initiatives happening in London. I think the dialogue is underway. It's a really uh, encouraging dialogue, and I think whatever a sustainable London might look like, I think we'll only get there if we collaborate and work together and take sort of a collective accountability before moving forward with collective action. Thank you.